Good. Today I'm going to talk about how to generate complexity from the simplest possible set of starting parameters. And what I'm going to do is see how far one can get by just using something in which we're all trapped and something which uh, defines the world we live in, which is space and time, relativistic space and time. And that space and time is a, a four parameter space, three, three of space, x, y, z, we can take to be x, y, and z, and one of time. However, I'm going to look at the fabric of space time, use the fabric of space time to define the kind of mathematics which I'm going to put everything together in eventually. But there has to be something within that space time. And the thing that um, I'm going to use is a root energy, a square root energy. Now, why square root energy, not energy? Energy is pretty fundamental, you might think, but square root energy, a square root might, it, it sounds a little bit more complicated, but it's not. The reason for using square root energy is that physical things in the physics which we use, in the differential equations we use, such as the electric field, the magnetic field, and the wave function in quantum mechanics, are all things which, in order to get the energy density, one needs to square. And I want to look at the fundamentals of where these things come from. So I'm going to go to the root energy. Now we're going to look at energy, we're going to need to find a square and then integrate over, over some volume to get the total energy. So we have a root energy density as a basis and space and time, five things. Now, what's up on the screen at the moment is, is the quisical electron. If one has the, the idea of, um, of um, that, that I'm going to try to pursue is to develop theories that are able to describe elementary particles themselves. Now, an elementary particle, such as the electron, is something which continuously recreates itself. It's dynamical, but it's in a continuous state of, of, of recreating itself through time, of circulating. Anything which is persistent, which exists for any length of time, is something which must come back to its starting position within within an oscillation period. Now, the oscillation period for electrons related to the Compton frequency, and we're talking about over 10 to the 20 hertz. So at, that, at, at faster than that rate, the electron is, whatever it does internally, coming back to itself. Now, there's a general theorem due to Gordon Pask that any such object must be topologically toroidal. And what you see in front of you is a toroidal set of self-recreating fields. One's drawn, the green for electric, uh, blue for magnetic, and the red field, the red vector here, gives the pointing vector, the direction of flow around, around, around that torus. So um, I'm going to be coming back to this, but before I do this, I want to do an overview of, the, of, the, of where we stand at the moment, why this is necessary, why one needs to go beyond the state of current of physics as it is. Now, this endeavor is something that's been the work of many people, over, over many years. But um, the particular thing I'm going to present was mostly um, carried out by my very good friend and co pilot Martin van der Mark. So a, a lot of, pretty much um, everything I'm going to present today has been a joint effort between the two of us. So, but there are other people involved and here's a quick um, view of those people. Um, Essentially, um, the shorter the wavelength of the of the name, the, the stronger the contributions. So, so uh, the purples and blues made significant contributions to the actual work, and uh, then going down through green and orange, eventually to red, uh, people who've been involved and least encouraging this this whole work. Now, what is the current situation? The current situation is that. Here in the 21st century, all of us have become used to not really understanding stuff. Now, the scope of the stuff we don't understand is, is, is enormous. Um, but what has been happening is technology, technology as it stands, seems to be extremely complicated, extremely complex. And technology is wonderful, but if, if you think about the actual things that are, our technology is based on, they're not really so very advanced in terms of the high theories that have been developed in the 20th century, largely. But the kind of stuff that really makes stuff work, that does technology, such things as pretty much Newton, Maxwell, 
with a little bit of relativistic, non-relativistic quantum mechanics in there if you're looking at solid state and solid state devices. And that's most of it. That really is pretty much it. Nearly everything, cars are fire powered. They're basically uh, Newton's laws for most of them, except for the electronic part, electronics part of them. But that's mostly Maxwell, mostly understandable within classical physics, within, uh, within simple models of, uh, of, of, of current and voltage and uh, power. Very little is based on the higher theories such that, that we've been developing, the so-called higher theories in the 20th century, such as such things as quantum chromodynamics, theory of um, the internal working of, um, of hadrons, or Big Bang theory, for example. Th these are not things on which we base our technology. Another thing that's happened with this enormous quantity of, uh, of uh, information that's sitting around is that people is that thinking or being able to think things through from first principles has gone out of fashion. It's become more fashionable to take information, usually from other people, from more or less reliable sources. And very often the ultimate authority that's been taken now in the 21st century is not thinking from first principles, but it's consulting an expert and having a look at the body of opinion, perhaps in Wikipedia. Of, uh, of, uh, of, of what other people think. Now, this is an insidious thing. And the idea of quite the Quisical project is to try and give people, insofar as is possible, the tools and the confidence to think for themselves. See, maths is a wonderful language. Mathematics, for example, or logic, it's a wonderful language. It, it can allow you to think things that otherwise couldn't be thought about at all. And if you want to go into looking at, uh, at how the universe works, you're going to come up against some pretty hefty mathematics, which takes really half a lifetime to understand. It enables the uninitiated, it enables people to think the otherwise unthinkable. It's a kind of software for your brain. It can enlighten you, it can allow you to think new things. But the mathematics, one must be very careful with it because mathematics can make you blind. It makes you blind to possibilities outside of the scope. Any particular mathematics is really an axiomatic system. And those axioms, those basic starting principles, once one starts sitting within the framework, are boundaries to that framework. So mathematics is a wonderful tool for going beyond the ordinary, but it is also something which, constrain, which you constrain yourself into by taking on board. So that's true of any logical system. Any logical system has boundaries. Now, this is a study. This is a position to be, I'm taking. My position is that if one has science and that science is immune from experiment, that that is a waste of life and talent. Anything which cannot be verified by nature, be tested against nature, is something which is in the old definition of science, not science at all. Science lives or dies by the way that it describes the natural world. If it describes it well, then maybe you'll take it further and think about it further. If it doesn't, it should be discarded and replaced with something that does. Any mathematics on invents, any logical framework on invents to describe the universe should therefore follow the physics and not the other way around, as is very often now the case. Now, Martin and myself worked for a long time, worked together to try and understand things, not to have them described by somebody else or learn them from a book, but to understand the fundamentals of how things work. And Quesical aims to do this. It aims to develop the mathematics and the confidence to enable anyone who follows this seriously to be able to think independently, analytically, and properly, and subject to the scientific method. It aims to throw light on things that matter, as we've uh, put it recently. Now, what about the current position of science? Science is wonderful. Science can do, uh, enables us to do things that previous generations couldn't dream of doing. What is science, though? What is the science scientific framework in which we live and in which we develop our technologies? Well, first of all, and for the last few hundred years, it's been Newton. It's been Newtonian mechanics. This is wonderful. It's a wonderful theory. It's useful. It's an approximation, as we know now, in certain areas. But in fact, it's an approximation that one really just uses to actually do stuff, to engineer things, one 
begins with Newton. To engineer bridges, to engineer cars, to engineer rockets. Rocket science is Newtonian. Further, about 150 years ago, Maxwell. The equations governing light. It's wonderful again, useful. The only thing about, and also the thing one uses to engineer systems such as um, optical fibers or uh, light or, or optical computers or anything to do with, with light, radio waves, televisions, um, mobile phones and so forth works through the differential equations described by Maxwell. Now, we now know that, um, that light is quantized in photons and one thing that Maxwell doesn't do is describe that quantization. But otherwise, it's perfect, and it's the thing one uses for doing technology, Maxwell's equations. Now, come to quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics is also wonderful and useful. If one's thinking about new kinds of quantum devices, one sinks into the framework of quantum mechanics as it is at the moment, and one imagines devices within the wave nature of electrons, pretty much in, the, uh, in electronics. It's, it is quantized. It's, it starts out with a, with a quantization well, assumption, really, with a quantization position that one takes, with a quantization axiom. So having taken on that axiom, which seems to reflect reality very, very well indeed, it can do an awful lot of things. It does it, though, in a complex way. Now, not complex just in that it's complicated, although it is very complicated to learn, but complex in the mathematical sense. Wave functions in quantum mechanics are complex. They have real and imaginary parts. That complexity goes a certain way to helping to describe how nature works. But in fact, it turns out that it's really too simple. And the reason, and, and actually it's just a, a child's copy, a, 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 a poor image of what's happening in, in reality, because the complex dimension is not a real dimension. It's not something which exists. It's neither space nor time, and it stands outside the things which I'm going to try and base this new physics on. So it's wonderful, it's complex, but it's actually too simple, really, to describe things within elementary particles. Now we go to something which, onto electrodynamics, this is, this is an interaction theory between charged particles and light. Again, it's wonderful. Now, but it's not so technologically useful. It's not the thing one uses for developing technologies. It's pretty much, it's simple at heart. The, the simplicity at the center of quantum electronics is that if one has a charge, that charge, and then one has a charge which is going to emit some, or a charged body that's going to emit some light, and another one which is going to absorb it, then there is a probability that a particular thing will emit and another thing will absorb. And it's that mutual probability which is given by the fine structure constant dimensionally alpha of quantum electronics, about 1 over 137, that determine pretty much the whole theory. The rest is some pretty hairy mathematics, but it's just the mathematics of saying how big something is with respect to something else. So describing such things as the inverse square um, way in which these things die out. Now, mathematics is pretty blinding, though. and the reason it's blinding is not just that the mathematics is complicated, but also that at the very heart of the thing, it turns out that it doesn't work unless you take a couple of parameters and normalize everything to those parameters. And those parameters are essential to the very thing that emits or absorbs light, the electron. They are, in fact, or it can be written as the electron charge and the electron mass. Now in the theory, both of these have to be infinite, positive infinite mass, negative infinite uh, electron charge. But one gets around this by doing one's calculations, one gets a very big number, but then by saying, okay, we can do the calculation for the charge and the mass as well, and we get an approximate, uh, a very big number as well. And then we divide it out, it's a process called renormalization. And if one does that, it gives the answers correct answers to eight or nine decimal places as, as pretty much as, as far as we've been able to test it against experiments. So it's a beautiful theory in terms of experiment, but it's not particularly a practical theory in terms of, in terms of developing technology. It's not something that one uses in the development, or not so often in the development of, uh, 
of, of, of devices and systems. So there are other kinds of theories. One of them is quantum chromodynamics, part of the standard model, which go beyond that and which extend that kind of method. But they extend that method. So quantum chromodynamics, well, I haven't said it's wonderful here. It's imaginative. It's fun. It's good to play with. It contains many things that are the truth, but it is almost completely and utterly useless. It's not useful in the, in the sense that it's not useful for developing technology. One doesn't use it. And also, it has many contradictions with experiment as it stands. Things that should exist within the theory, such as, for example, the idea is that quarks are held together with gluons. The theory predicts that gluons should also form states with each other and should stick together in glue balls. Now, glue balls are not observed. So if one looks in detail at this, there are lots of contradictions with experiments. I'm not going to go too far into QCD here because it's something which has a very large number of parameters which describe it. So I'm going to leave QCD aside. It's not one of the things that I'm going to try and um, reproduce in terms of just space, time, and root energy. Then there are some other theories um, which I haven't included at the beginning, although you might have thought I should have done. Relativity is one of them. Now, relativity is, again, wonderful, exact, very useful, but it's essentially contained within the Maxwell theory, which predates it in many ways, as I'll show later in this series of, in this course. Now, there's another aspect of relativity, Einstein's general relativity. Now, again, this is exact, is useful again. It's used in, for example, GPS systems. And it's exact as it has been tested so far, but those tests have all been in the very much financially low mass limit. Probably, and Einstein would have said this himself, it will turn out to be an approximation in the fullness of time if one looks at very high mass systems. But we don't know that at the moment. For the time being, as far as we know, it's not contradicted by any experiment. But we haven't been able to experiment in the very high mass limit where which is the only place you would find contradictions to it. And then the last of these is relativistic quantum mechanics. Relativistic quantum mechanics is a strange beast. It's something which is both the father and the son of ordinary quantum mechanics. It, the original work on this led to certain aspects which were necessary for the starting point of ordinary quantum mechanics, carried out by Louis de Broglie in terms of having a look at the relativistic oscillator, quantum oscillator. So it gave rise to quantum mechanics about seven years later after de Broglie's initial pioneering research. But then the quantum mechanics itself also developed into relativistic quantum mechanics, most uh, reaching its pinnacle pretty much under, under Dirac. But all of this work happened 90 years ago. We're talking about, and it's, Strange theory because it should be very useful, but it's not really. It's almost completely useless. It's, it's broken. This is a theory that needs fixing. And part of what I'm going to try and do is present a relativistic quantum mechanics that I think it should have been in the next series of lectures. So um, all of the above theories, though, they're all good. All, they all reflect and describe some aspect of reality. Some of those aspects of reality really cover pretty much everything you see around you that's been created by humans that's technologically modern. Others of them less so, but still contain, even QCD, a very great deal of truth. These are theories that if one wants to develop another theory, you, it, they have to be either in agreement with those theories, either encompassing them, or extending them so that they reduce to them in some limit, or explaining their starting points, saying this is the basis for this theory. You start from this point, that's the set of axioms which then lead on to the rest of that science. Because all of these theories are a very good reflection of certain aspects of reality. So if one's developing science, it's not just making things up. One's developing science, one is stuck within a framework, and that framework is a framework of stuff we already know works. And this is pretty much that uh, an overview of that position as it now stands. But one thing that's worth 
um, saying about these theories is there are really two different classes of theories in the list in front of you. One class is a class based on differential and integral equations, on equations that are dynamical equations that tell you how stuff moves. Newton's laws are an example, F equals MA. The acceleration of body depends on the force and uh, the mass of that body. Maxwell, again, there's a set of coupled differential equations that tell you how light works and how, if given a particular electromagnetic uh, configuration and boundary conditions, that will develop in time and space. So, so these are differential equations. Um, and the equations that are built like that include quantum mechanics, relativistic quantum mechanics, Maxwell's equations, Newton, and also Einstein's equations, both general and special relativity. But the, there are another couple of theories here that are different. They deal with particle exchange, with the idea that a force is intermediated by an exchange of particles. In the case of quantum electrodynamics, the electromagnetic force is, inter is intermediated by photon exchange. Now, these theories, this theory is fine if one wants to, if one takes the particles as a given and something which are indestructible, and electrons are pretty much indestructible, so it's a very good theory in terms of working with things. But it's not fine if one wants to understand the working of the particles themselves, because you're taking the particles as a given. The theory is not describing how the particles work, but that they exist, and then given that they exist, what they do. Now, QED is quantum electrodynamics is such a theory. So is quantum chromodynamics. Quantum electrodynamics is on much better footing, of course, it agrees with experiment as far as we know. Quantum chromodynamics much less so for two reasons. One is it doesn't agree with experiment in all cases. And the second one is, the exchange particles have never been observed. So in, in quantum chromodynamics, one has gluon exchange holding hadrons together. So another reason why I'm not going to consider it further. Now, before going too much further, and in the framework of thinking about getting people thinking rather than taking things from information, there's a huge danger that our thinking can be mired in complexity. What do I mean by that? If you're thinking about nature, in, in terms of thinking about nature, we, we tend to think about it just as what we see. But if you want to understand nature, one needs to, you need to think like that aspect of nature. You need to put yourself into the position of that elementary interaction and see, for example, in understanding light, the universe from the point of view of light. What does the universe look like to light? Now, that's a much simpler thing than looking at the universe, which looks very complex, right? It's still very complex, but it's much simpler than trying to understand all the universe at once. But one needs to go into the nature of that thing and think only with that thing's own nature. And this can be very difficult for humans to dissociate themselves from the world that they think they live in, which is really the world that you've made up inside your own head. And the job of a scientist is to try and think like nature. Now, one can use mathematics to do this. It can allow one to look at the otherwise unseeable. If one's talking even just about special relativity, about the transformation of space-time, they seem very mysterious to most. But if you understand the mathematics, if you work hard, then they become not mysterious at all. One can think inside them. But in thinking inside any framework, as I've said before, you're stuck with that framework. And if one wants to think about light, that's fine. But if one wants to think about the interaction of light and matter, that may not be enough. You may need to step outside it and look at it from the outside. Now, the scientific method, the thing that's really created the modern world in the last 500 years or so, only works when it can be divorced from opinion. It's okay to have an opinion about anything, to think the world is flat, for example, but um, science always challenges such things with, for example, the flat earth picture of the earth from space. It's the scientific method that has delivered the progress in the last 500 years. As opposed to, as compared to any other 500 years in human history, the progress in the last 500 years has been spectacularly different to the progress, for example, between 500 BC and 0 AD. And, and any other period you'd care to put, put a little uh, bracket around. 
And that has been achieved by not listening to authority, but by looking at one's ideas, whatever they are, whatever beautiful theory you might have come up with, and then testing them against the reality of what actually happens. And anything which fills that test, well, you have to either make it better, if it can be made better, or you have to discard it and just think again. So science is conditioned by reality, by nature. It's subject to nature, should be. Too often now people think it's okay that it's not. It's not okay. If you're doing something which is a many worlds theory where you're making something up, it's fine to make things up, it's lovely to imagine that there may be many different worlds. But that's not science. It's not science because one cannot measure it. It can't be tested. You're just making it up and suddenly you're outside of the testable. And if you're outside of the testable, it can be fantastic stuff. It can be the greatest art, but it is not science. Not science as it was defined, at least in the period where science made a lot of progress. And you've got to be completely on, you've, one must be continually on guard not to be blinded by one's own supposed cleverness. It's easy to get lost in blinding constructs of your own making if you're eigen advice. But it's also possible to get lost in the constructs of others. Now that may be comforting, it may be a nice place to be, but again, it's not free thinking, it's not going to make progress. You're simply copying what somebody else has told you is the truth. In investigating the truth, one must really be able to, in understanding the truth, one does need to understand it. You need to be able to encompass it. You need to be able to completely get what's going on, perhaps not at the very highest level, but at least in the conceptual framework of what, what really is happening. Now, anyone acting as a scientist has to practice absolute humility to what nature is telling them. It doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, how nice it is, if it disagrees with nature, you've messed up. This can be a very difficult thing to do. Separating yourself from, from, uh, from what you think you know is one of the very hardest things to do. And many, many people think they know an awful lot. But actually, the more that you do know, the more you understand, really, the more that you know that you don't know. The more things you understand, the more things raise questions, the more areas there are to question. So this is a never ending process, this process of scientific development, and we're certainly not at any kind of, near any kind of end. All of the, now, so be very, 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 very careful of opinion masquerading as science. Science is only science if you yourself, if well, can really grasp it. If you can see that it makes, that it is properly in accordance with things as they are, then it may be the truth. And okay, we can appoint some clever people to test such things and come back to us and say, this is not in accord with nature because, and perhaps explain that. And that's the fine thing, to, that's proper science to try and knock theories over, not to try and set them up. One thing Quisicle aims to do is to never accept others' authority. On, we aim to learn to think things through for ourselves, to be able to understand things. So opening the doors to thinking is the key aim of the Quisicle Society, which this is um, a beginning talk. Now, right, so that's science as it stands. That's the context, I see. Now I want to go on to thinking about the constraints under which we live. Now, what do I mean by constraints? I mean, one doesn't have complete freedom to do anything. One has freedom to imagine anything, but not to not to do anything. You can't just jump out of the window and fly, for example. There are a set of constraints that uh, condition human behavior. 
some of those constraints are so overarching that we very seldom even think of them. And And uh, so what are the constraints? What are the constraints under which we live? Thinking about them, I'm gonna try and put these in some sort of order. Well, one of the strongest constraints in which we live is that of space and time itself. We're stuck in space and time. We can't jump outside space and time, space and time and have a look at it from the outside. There is no outside. We're creatures trapped in this space time, whatever it is, observing it from the inside. Space time, Space-time is also something which is quite complex. It's something which people talk about the fabric of space-time. It's something which defines where and when things are, whatever those things are. But um, that space-time does is subject to other constraints itself. Although we're strapped in space-time, we know that space-time is a little bit floppy. It, it's, it's, it's a well-constrained floppiness, but it's floppy in the sense that it that, it, um, that, it, that it's altered by certain things. It's itself subject to higher constraints than space and time themselves. So let's think of it. So space and time themselves, they're constrained and bound by other things. And what, one of the things, one of the higher order constraints, if you like, is that of conservation of energy. Energy is absolutely conserved so far as we know, as far as is measured in experiment. <clears throat> And space and time themselves are both so constrained by energy, but they're also bounded by energy, by energy's conservation, and also by such things as relative motion. As one moves with respect to another thing, space and time change. They alter until when one's moving very fast indeed, and very fast indeed here is the speed of light. Space and time relativistically shrink to nothing at all. So at the speed of light, any distance is no distance. Space and time themselves are fluid with respect to motion. So they're constrained by some deeper constraints that themselves modify the nature of that thing, whatever it is. Now, that thing, whatever it is, space and time, we don't know really what space and time really are in terms of something else. You have to take those as a given. That's the starting point, and that's one. Of, that's four of the starting points I'm going to take. Why? Because well, because we have no alternative. So, what does energy do to space time? Well, in, in a in, in in terms of not energy in a can of beans, but energy in a in a quantum particle, the energy is given by Planck's constant times the frequency. So. Energy sets a scale, it's a quantum scale of rulers and clocks for that object. That scale of rulers and clocks is given by an equation. So essentially the higher the equation, the shorter the ruler, the faster the clock ticks according to relative relativity. So in quantum particles, this is how the whole of quantum mechanics started. It started with Louis de Broglie thinking about how a relativistic ruler clock would work. Now, so conservation of energy rules over even space and time. So in the things I'm going to take, en root energy, space and time, root energy is the more, more fundamental one. It sits higher in the hierarchy. But there are other conservation laws too. Other conservation laws, some of these can be described as equations. But the equation for energy is that the total change in energy is equal to zero in any interaction that energy is always conserved, doesn't change. We transform from one sort to another, but it remains the same. Same is true of some other pretty fundamental things. One of these is momentum. Another one is spin, angular momentum. These are actually related to energy, as we'll come to see later, but, um, but have a different form and have a different, and impose different conditions on anything which can exist and can self create itself, an elementary particle, for example. And there are lower level constraints as well, which we know about. But they're still absolute as far as we know. One of these is the conservation of charge. Now, why do I say it's lower level? Because in the theory I'm going to present, charge comes out rather than having to be put in from some of these other constraints. So it's at a lower level, but it's still an absolute conservation. Other ones, lepton number, for example, the number of um, electrons is or electron-like objects is absolutely conserved. So there's a set of these. 
in standard model in normal physics, all of which have to work in any extension of science as we know it. And at a lower level still, there are other constraints that um, are approximately conserved. I'm not going to go too far into those because we could get into quite a good discussion about these things and that discussion has been held elsewhere. They might be conserved within a particular kind of interaction and not in another, or they might only be approximately conserved. And somewhere in between all of these things are the equations I talked about before, the equations of science, the differential and integral equations governing allowed processes, allowed transformations in nature such as the so-called laws of Newton, Maxwell, Einstein, and Schrodinger for quantum mechanics, and so on. So these are a constraint as well. The equations constrain the kind of transformations that can happen. Sitting on top of that are such things as conservation of energy, which constrains absolutely how um, even the mathematics works. It has to be unitary. So any transformation has to, well, what that means physically is that any transformation has to and end up with as much energy as it started with, any allowed transformation. But to understand as much as is possible, I'm going to take only the highest level constraints and try and work with those and see how far that gets us. And for me, those high level constraints are space, time, and most especially square root energy. Let's see how far we we'll get. So one thing that's interesting though to say is just in order to give one give people a, a feeling as to why this is this is important, that it's square root energy and not a, not a, not not an energy, is because it's because speed bends space and time. At light speed, bends space and time to a point, the point of emission absorption of photon for the photon, thinking in terms of the nature of a photon, for a photon, the emission absorption take place at the same point in space time. For a massless photon always for the photon not for you and not for the absorber not for the emitter not for the absorber one sees how if you want to measure any energy if you want to look at any energy one sees only the overlap you don't see the wave function you don't see the electric field you see only an interaction interaction for electromagnetism is from a charge to another charge so you have a charge plus a photon plus a charge. The bookends are important. It has to have a beginning and an end in order to have a defined energy. That defined energy depends on the beginning and the end and its motion. So um, that's what we're going to consider. Um, I think we'll stop here momentarily and start a new video file um, with going on to the theory itself. So I'll come back and talk to everybody briefly. Could you